Welcome. This is the fifth in a series of interviews, Institute Encounters, uh, that the Institute for the Study of Western Civilization has sponsored. Uh, today we have, uh, very fortunate to have as our guest, Dr. Peter Lindert, who is Distinguished Professor of Economics at the University of California, Davis. Uh, he is an authority on economic history uh, and particularly on the study of economic equality and inequality. He is the author of many books and articles, including most recently, Growing Public uh, Social Spending and Economic Growth. Uh, he is a past president of the Economic History Association, uh, as well as uh, a co-editor of the Journal of Economic History. So I want to welcome Professor Lindhurt. Thank, Thank you, Thank you very much for coming here. Uh, and uh, just start off by asking you the question, what does the study of economic inequality, uh, his, in, in looking back at, 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 at the history of the United States and, and, and what the Western world, what does that constitute? It constitutes a, a measure of the, the desire to measure and explain what happened to the differences between people's material living standards. Why did some have so much more than others? accident, um, individual merit, um, fortunes of the economy, injustices, etc. That's what gets the general public uh, quite interested in the subject of inequality, and it got me interested in it too. Um, I developed this interest along with others, which are uh, different topics. Um, Pretty early on in my career, uh, back in the 1970s, one of the forming influences for me was, well, that I had been in the civil rights movement, and so it's a natural transition to think about inequality. Another is that I was at the University of Wisconsin as a faculty member, where uh, they had this wonderful Institute for Research on Poverty that does very good scientific work on issues about who's poor and why. And that also led naturally to um, interest in inequality. And I've been doing it ever since, with my role becoming more the documenter of inequality than the interpreter. You don't read me about the big think as to why we have inequality. I'm happy to talk about it because I'm fascinated. My role came to be, though, to measure exactly who was, which societies had greater inequality uh, than which others, and make some feeble attempts to say historically why that was true. So it's partly cross-national. You're sort of interested yeah, in the state sure. of inequality, country to country. Yes. And it's partly historical. You're interested in how levels of inequality have evolved over time. Yes. And, um, you know, we like to think that we live in a society in which equality uh, is one of the paramount values. Uh, but I gather even in relatively recent history there have been some significant changes in the level of measured yes. equality and inequality. Uh, and if you take a look at, if you go back deep, more deeply into the past, and I take it that at least in some countries the documentation is such that this is a kind of feasible uh, academic enterprise. If you go back into the past, mm -hmm. uh, you can see some pretty notable changes. There's a good conceptual reason why almost one has to in order to stay connected with uh, the audience. Because everybody professes to care in some way about inequality. The trouble is, if you ask a person, what's the right level of inequality? How unequal should people be? don't have any answer. Uh, it's not something you can define as an absolute unless you invent your own preferences and ta-da, there they are, the world should think like you. But nobody can say what's the exact right amount of it, inequality or equality. Certainly everybody should not have exactly the same income no matter what they do. And it should not all go into the hands of one Mobutu family. Where are we in between? People don't know. What's interesting, though, is, and this is why uh, this is a comparative study and a historical study, just as soon as I tell people 
Um, did you know that inequality was different in these two settings? Like it be in the United States since the 1970s, it became more unequal today than it was in the 70s. Or it's more unequal in China than in um, Norway. That, oh, suddenly they're very interested. Now, why is that true? Ooh, that's important. You would really like to know. So everybody actually has a relativist, comparative sense about the importance of this issue. Therefore, they want to know how it moves over time and space. They think that the question of equality and inequality is morally significant. This sort of they think it's they uh, think it's morally significant. They can't tell you why, but they do. So, and I've always had this funny relationship to the subject um, that I just know I'm interested, others are interested in seeing how it moved over time. I guess maybe one of the thoughts in our heads that we haven't been able to get very explicit about is, wouldn't it be nice to be lucky and have just the natural workings of market forces make us all very equal? Wouldn't that be such a lucky society? And we saw, yes, 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 we would like that. So see, we do care. Mm -hmm. We do care about the inequality of condition. But then the issue becomes um, what would make that happen if it doesn't happen just by luck. So what is the larger picture? If you look at, mm -hmm. say, the United States and, and Britain, the two mm -hmm. great Anglo-Saxon countries, if you yeah. take a look at those, um, what, what, what do you see with respect to the evolution of equality and inequality over the past few centuries? Okay. For uh, both countries, inequality rose at some early stage. They are actually some centuries apart, those early stages. And for both countries, like for every industrial country in the world, in inequality shrank. And as we got more similar to each other across the first half of the 20th century, a very interesting time in that respect, uh, coming into the 1950s from the 1920s or 10, teens. Um, and so that by the 1950s, in both of our countries and in other industrial countries, here was a symptom of good luck in society. The symptom is the rich were writing complaining that it was hard to get good help these days. And that's a very healthy sign in society. It would be nice if just even under ordinary market conditions it would be hard to get good help. That would be a very healthy sign. Since then we widened out again both Britain and America, especially America, since the 1970s. And why do you think that happened? The latest widening? Yes. Okay, the latest widening the main, uh, there are debates, the main reason is clearly uh, a pair of, re a pair of reasons. Uh, technological imbalance. Suddenly all of the uh, rewards shift toward uh, those with higher skills and uh, brain power. Think Bill Gates. Happening in both countries. In both countries, uh, it happened more in America, both the technology mm -hmm. and the inequality result than in Britain, but in both countries. That's going on, and now at the same time, I'm speaking here mainly about the American case, there was a slowdown since the 1970s in how fast our uh, educational attainments were keeping up with it. So we weren't doing quite all we could do to become the technological mm, powers. There was a greater challenge for our schools and yeah. they were not meeting it. They were not, or the students were not, something was not meeting mm -hmm. it uh, because certainly from the 1980s to the, uh, uh, to the end of the century we had a real slowdown in educational attainment which is you know how far in school you continue. Is this Britain as well? Or um, um, uh, here I speak mainly of the US. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so technology is running ahead of our education and skills. In the United States, thank goodness... Can I just ask you a further question? Yeah. Where do you see within education the greatest failure? At the lower levels or at the higher levels? Definitely at the lower levels, mm -hmm. especially at the United States. Uh, this country's... We can think of ways that universities might be run better, but it's just in a, in a worldwide setting we're doing very well. Primary and secondary is the problem in America. And you can see that now with all kinds of international test scores. 
So we're not, do, we're not doing well in primary and secondary. And that is another thing, by the way, which gives an inegalitarian outcome. Uh, people will be more unequal if those who had the resources and the parental resources to get into college are doing extremely well and becoming the technicians and the entrepreneurs. So if you don't have the family intellectual capital, you need the institutional intellectual capital to make up for that. The insertion of intellectual was your idea. <laughs> uh, if you didn't have the resources, it could be intellectual, it could be family finances. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, those kinds of gaps have opened up. The first way, if you had to do a, give a one-word answer, you could say technology. You know that is really automation and technology, computerization, etc. That's a big deal in this era. It's not always true throughout history that technology has this effect, but it certainly has mm -hmm. in these last forty-something mm -hmm. years. So you would think those are the two major factors in the United States? Right there, yes. Now others have been debated, like globalization. Did globalization make Britons and Americans more unequal? Uh, the scholarly answer seems to be yes, that's less than half the story. Small effect. Mm -hmm. In other words, the unskilled in these uh, countries can't match, uh, can't get very good pay, both because some immigrants are coming in, competing for the worst jobs, and because we can't produce the kinds of goods anymore, like think textiles and apparel, mm -hmm. that use a lot of low-skilled labor because we can't compete with Bangladesh, which is now part of the world economy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is a, a, a minor player in the story. Mm -hmm. The weakening of unions is another uh, that has made things more unequal, because the unions did fight for you know minimum wages and for uh, pay scales within industry that were compressed. So would some and, say that that kind of causes more unemployment? Uh, the minimum wage one does. Uh, many would say that. Uh, I would be with the more conventional view on that issue. It probably could cause some. Uh, so, but again, the weakening of the unions is a minor player, as is the globalization. The main thing is just flat out technology in relationship to our skills. So it seems to be two things. It seems to be in part um, technological innovation, kind of which is market driven more or less, and a kind of institutional failure on the part of the school system to adapt. So there's a political element of some sort in it too. Okay. I'll go with that. All right. Okay. <laughs> I'll go with that. Um, uh, what, what, what are the policy remedies in that case? Or would you, I mean, if you care to offer a few ideas on that? Well, to <coughs> stay on this uh, latest uh, motif, uh, one is to have better human investments in, uh, that would be more resources put into early education. I had mentioned that primary and secondary were in trouble. There's a large literature right now which is showing we've especially failed, some other countries as well, in uh, preschool, in very early. Uh, we've done a bad job there. And giving people more of all of that is going to be good for both for growth and for equality. That would be the main thing. The other is, um, at the primary and secondary level, yes, uh, we need, we could use some more competition so that people have more options. Uh, with the right kinds of uh, safeguards regarding uh, curriculum, etc. I would say you could have more school choice um, for primary and secondary. We already have it for university. The university is a, a really competitive market. There are public, there are private, they all compete, and the uh, consumers are smart, sovereign, there's no problem at the university level. Uh, primary and secondary, yes, we need more human investments of resources and more institutional competition among the suppliers of the education. So if you look back more, more deeply into the past, um, you see, uh, I don't know how far back we can confidently look into the past, but if we take the period of, of, of industrialization, the, the big industrial breakthrough mm -hmm. of the West beginning basically largely in the 18th century in, 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 in Britain and then sort of spreading, uh, I gather you don't think that that produced more inequality than it 
previously existed. That kind of technological innovation didn't have the same effects as the technological innovation of the last 40 years or so. Yes, I agree with the way you put it. Uh, that's my view. And, and why was why? that? Uh, interestingly, for a number of reasons, uh, First of all, to, comp uh, to pick up on your contrast with the more recent the time, since the 1970s. In fact, the so-called Industrial Revolution, wow, suddenly the, uh, the satanic mills are going and this is all of British life, uh, that's wildly exaggerated. The change was extremely gradual in those days. The, their lives did not change, despite that phrase, Industrial Revolution, their lives did not change at anything like the pace that ours are changing today. It's only a revolution compared to the 5,000 years that preceded it. Yeah, that's right, that's right, yeah, when nothing happened, or very little. Uh, but so, yes, I like that way of putting it. Um, the Industrial Revolution is a much smaller deal than the revolution in our lives, technologically and economically, since the 1970s. So that's one reason why I, one comparison in which I would de-emphasize the Industrial Revolution and as a source of inequality. The other is that inequality in a European country, let's say Britain, was getting wider uh, even without industrial revolution simply because of uh, population growth pressing against uh, a fixed land endowment of property. So Malthusian trap. Uh, Malthusian trap. Uh, and I think that trap indeed uh, produced its maximum inequality in Britain and Western Europe at the time Malthus wrote. So, as you were kind of saying to me in an earlier conversation, right. Malthusian trap means that the value of labor diminishes because there's more and more people, but the value of land, if you own land, if you're part of the aristocratic class, uh, that in fact increases in relative value as a factor of production. So, right. your own wealth becomes proportionally greater than the wealth of the people who earn their living by labor. Yes. All of that in relative terms. The uh, value of the labor didn't exactly go down, but it definitely failed to keep mm -hmm. pace with mm -hmm. the value of what the mm -hmm. landowners were getting, etc. So that was happening in Britain. America, um, Jeffrey Williamson and I have just found that, um, yes indeed, America in its earliest time that we have a measure of, and that it's his and my measure, of the inequality of income is 1774, on the eve of the revolution. Mm -hmm. It's actually British America. Mm -hmm. And there, the Americans are much more equal than they became. Now, what happened later in America, you could say there was some contribution of industrialization to it or immigration to it. But really, if you just look at the American landscape as this a uh, place that was largely unsettled because of the diseases wiping out the Native Americans. Um, that was a situation where labor ha had to be so scarce relative to land. Just the mere settlement of the country would mean that eventually you're going to get uh, rising inequality, and we did. So it was actually something still a little different from industrialization. Um, very interesting. And by the way, the Americans were Notice that the Americans were highly, uh, highly equal to each other, even before our own institutions were set up. In other words, when we still had British institutions, mm -hmm. that was already true. Uh, kind of an interesting uh, perspective. Uh, and then in the 19th century, um, so, so you, are, does the, does the industrialization have very much to do with this at all? It has some. It has some, but all basically, those great fortunes being uh, made. Uh, great fortunes are being made. Sure, uh, railroads, oil. Uh, etc. Great fortunes being uh, Carnegie and Steel. But um, even beyond those anecdotes, industrialization is part of the story, but the sheer population growth and the uh, elimination of the frontier, so that land now does become something scarce. Minerals become something increasingly scarce over time. Uh, all of that is destined to make us stop being the world's most equal society as we were in colonial times and, and become one of the typically highly unequal ones by the early 20th century. Quick footnote on early colonial, if I said Americans were equal, what about slaves? Um, Americans were highly unequal if you put a high value on personal freedom, mm -hmm. of course, because they didn't have personal freedom. In terms of consumption levels, 
the slaves were not that low. And so my comment as an income inequality mm -hmm. comment was mm -hmm. still, mm -hmm. as I said. Your, your explanation, except for the last 30 or 40 years, mm -hmm. where it seems to uh, largely depend on this explosion of advanced technology, mm -hmm. Uh, your, your explanation doesn't really give very much weight in, in either case to political and institutional changes. It right. seems to track more natural factors, one might say. Yes. Um, does that make yes. you unusual as an economic historian, is that a, or is that a consensus view? Um, there wouldn't be a consensus view no. because these things are debated still, I think is a fair statement. Uh, now that's good. I like the way you ask that. Uh, we had, we were we have been buffeted by very natural forces. Yes, uh, where I will get into institutions and like fiscal redistribution from one group in society to another, etc., would be in the 20th and 21st century contrast between us and some other countries. Ah, then it becomes more important. Why are we different from? the Europeans, the Japanese, etc. Uh, well, it is a little bit more about how things were done institutionally. So the big macro longitudinal view yeah, is, is looking at these natural factors. Yes. Whereas when we do sort of more finely tuned cross-sectional views, mm -hmm. institutions look more important in that context. Yeah, and that's, that, that sounds right. What, what, what is the, we'll, we'll come back to that, but what is, what is the relationship uh, between inequality um, and economic growth. Is there a relationship there? Um, that, uh, so I have a take on that. Um, it won't surprise you that ideal, ideologues will cook their own view about the relationship of inequality to economic growth. It won't surprise you that uh, someone on the left will say, oh, actually we need people to be more equal to have a uh, faster growing society and they'll have some economic arguments that they're mm -hmm. uh, And on the right, oh, inequality we need because uh, it's sort of a trickle-down concept. We need to have a lot of accumulation and only the richest will do it. You know the story. Uh, I don't believe either of those. Uh, in fact, I, I couldn't start my story from economic inequality as an influence on economic growth. What actually is the right way to do this is to say, let's talk about political inequality and economic growth. Because if a political voice is highly unequal, or only the elite have it, typically what will happen is that the elite will avoid not only redistributing income against themselves, but they will avoid uh, invest, investing in like schooling, most important. Basic schooling public goods, for the masses. Yeah, companies. basic schooling for the masses, public goods more broadly. They will be all against that because, as one conservative said in 1807 in Parliament when voting against any money for public schools, was, oh, there are three things wrong with it. One, um, it will make them into bad uh, agricultural laborers. They won't be very submissive and stick around and uh, work for us at a low wage. Two, it will make them read seditious pamphlets, intellectual argument. Three, uh, we, we, we would have to pay taxes for it. Tiny in those days, but you know, the, the point was correct. Mm -hmm. So for all those reasons, when you had elite uh, voice, so political inequality, who has a say in society? If that's highly unequal, that will be bad for growth, uh, is, is, has always been my slant. Uh, you couldn't really start from the economic inequality because you'd have to know why they were economically unequal. And it could be pro or anti-growth. Now, if you, if you need a well-educated working force, mm -hmm. uh, and so you have to have human capital and you have to invest in it, um, and it's not going to be in the short-term service of the folks who have the most wealth to, to do that, they, they're, they're not thinking, perhaps, in terms of long-term, right? they're thinking in terms of their own pocketbooks, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, there, uh, the voice expressed will be a political voice through the electoral process. Mm -hmm. But growth began before democracy began. True. So is there a kind of political voice or a voice of some sort uh, that you can see 
working itself out against earlier forms of privilege during the preceding period, during the, the 18th century, the very late 17th yes. century. Um, perhaps not taking the form, well, maybe to some extent, taking the form of, of elections with a restricted franchise, but still more than before. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, a lot of people would argue that there's a kind of institutional framework more conducive to growth. Uh, and while it may not always involve elections, it does involve opportunities for people to make choices that they didn't have before French Revolution abolishes serfdom, for example, mm -hmm. which even without elections, though they have elections too, would give people more voice, more agency. Mm -hmm. Is, do, do you see that kind of thing in the earlier phase? Yes. Here's the way I would characterize an earlier phase and a later. Uh, it's what is most important of all the many things lacking for well, economic growth. What is most important um, as an improvement. So medieval and early modern, one of the most important things was simply um, decentralized, legally upheld property rights, private property rights. So for the early phase you could get almost what I would call a chamber of commerce view as to what's important for growth. Um, avoid confiscation by the uh, local warlord. Uh, so property is a kind of voice. Property is a kind of voice and, uh, and of great importance uh, up until about the 18th century. Now, uh, and after that I put less emphasis on it because most of these Western countries began to honor that, so we had sort of solved yeah, that, that problem. That foundation is laid. The, that foundation is laid, and then uh, later on, it, the other uh, kind of story that I was telling you, which is What's really most important is getting investments in human capital, which an ordinary private capital market can't do. And getting that and getting the elite to yield and let that happen for the entire population. So from about 1800 on, that becomes uh, the main differentiator as to who has institutions favorable to growth. So which countries uh, in Europe and the world uh, on that measure had institutions more favorable to growth? In right now, we have sort of a tie game between most of the OECD countries. They are all similarly favorable institutions. I'm, I'm thinking in the 19th century. Or oh, 19th century. Uh, give me a timeline in uh, 19, year 1900. 1850, 1850 to mm. First World War. 1850 to First World War. Um, the institutions for, that were best for growth were those practiced by the countries that had already become richest, setting aside their handling of other colonies elsewhere. Yeah. So political voice aside for a moment, simply the level of wealth makes a difference. No, you, it, the institutions are the causal force in your and my discussion. The institutions are the causal force and they have already borne fruit so that these countries are, um, have higher incomes and wealth. And so basically just look at who is succeeding in that time. But, but, but in, in the case of the United Kingdom, uh, the investment in public education was relatively low. Uh, in uh, they, the first part of the 19th century, certainly, yes, they, catching up in the they second. lagged, they lagged. And, and yet they had been the leader up to that point in terms of growth. Yes, uh, and uh, ironically, I have found uh, Right and when Britain is at its world peak of power and prominence and relative income and wealth, they also had uh, particularly anti-growth policies, which was the failure to do the local civilian investments, especially schooling, mass schooling. Britain did wake up. And so uh, 1890-91, suddenly, bing, they uh, set up a, a good mass schooling system. Uh, theirs is slightly better than ours today mm -hmm. uh, at the primary and secondary level. You think Germany did a relatively good job? Yes. Western Germany, 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 Germany particularly. Uh, not Prussia so much. Yes, mm -hmm. correct. And so Germany is a leader like us uh, in the 19th century in education. And education is not just a hobby horse of mine. I mean, anybody would see that this is a major contributor to growth. And it had to be public, uh, as even uh, our leader said at the time, because basically you can't get a bank to lend to you to be repaid by your child's 
earning power when your child reaches 40 or 50. You know, the system, the capital markets can't do that. Mm -hmm. So just let it be uh, public. Uh, well, even Milton Friedman said that. What, what, what's, the, what's the story of uh, the United States in this respect? Uh, we were leaders. This is, this is a, a peculiar twist of history. We who were, you know, anti-George III and, and very decentralized and please leave us alone sort of in our philosophy, were as early as any country in deciding to you to have universal tax-based education. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and it's at the local level. Communities, you see, because they all had the sense of community. Mm -hmm. It's just mm -hmm. our own town, etc. And um, they in, in, innovated with the property tax in the 18th century, in early 19th. Uh, the Americans were actual leaders in that kind of local school uh, framework. So you, you would not have you would not have found that in rural England. Oh uh, yes, the spirit would have been there. Mm -hmm. The desire would have been there. England had an institutional trap. You could not. Uh, local government could not, in the 19th century, raise taxes for its own local schools. Uh, parliament had to do it. Uh, but Parliament, until late in the 19th century, has a, has a very landlord bias, etc. They're just not interested in this. And they were hung up on Anglicans defending the system versus the dissenters and others who wanted modern industry more. So centralization here works. Centralization was a trap for England. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we got ahead in that way. Well, let's take a look at the comparative perspective today. Mm -hmm. um, first off, if you take the developed world and compare it to the less developed or developing world, what do you find there? In, uh, are we on education policy? No, no, in we're, 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 we're in equality, oh, okay. inequality more generally. Yeah, okay, in yeah. equality and inequality more generally. More generally, the truly uh, well-off countries have less inequality than the very poor. Um, so there, there is a compression, an equalization that seems to happen as a net result over modernization. Is that a holdover from the older circumstance of the net relative worth of land versus labor in a poor economy? I think it is a holdover from, it's not, sorry, not a holdover, it is a byproduct of the, why, the diffusion of skills and the greater human investments made in the mm -hmm. countries that became rich. Mm -hmm. That's the crucial difference between them and the poor countries. They became rich because they made those investments and then having become rich they were in a position to make even more investment. Yes, and uh, they, this, they did enough of it so that their skills outran any population growth. We didn't mm -hmm. get a new flood of um, really poor people. Uh, so it is generally true when you look at the, a scatter diagram all across the world, the higher income countries are more equal within themselves. And if you look within the developed world, mm -hmm. including the developed countries of the Far East in this mm -hmm. case, mm -hmm. Japan and Korea, sorry, right. Taiwan, uh, what do you see there? In terms of inequality, the let's set aside oil sheepdoms, and we're just talking about you know, countries that made themselves. The United States is the leader in inequality. Uh, after China and Singapore, so we are highly unequal. When you say China, do you mean that the people's people's Republic? Republic. people's Republic? What about China? Taiwan? Uh, Taiwan, no, uh, more equality mm -hmm. in Taiwan mm -hmm. than in the People's Republic. Because mm -hmm. Taiwan, no, Taiwan does not have a um, big hinterland of, you know, from inherited from a peasant past. So they're, they're much better off. Taiwan is like Korea or Japan in that respect. So we are the, among the most unequal, very equal among very rich countries would be the Western Europeans, especially, yeah. And 
Does it vary north to south? It does vary. Let's see, I got to pause here. Certainly, in what people end up with after the effect of government taxes and transfers, etc., does vary north to south. In other words, the northern Europeans are more equal within their society. You make the distinction of somebody running between pre pre fisc and after fisc, as before yes. taxes and after taxes. Yeah. Would, would, uh, is what you're saying now before or after taxes with respect to these comparisons? Okay. For most of our discussion here, I have, we haven't had to face this distinction. Now today, with, in a world of larger government, uh, we have to, do have to face it. So today, uh, here's how it goes. Uh, everything that we've just said, I've just said about contrasting the US, China, Singapore versus these others, everything you know is after taxes. If I went before taxes, these differences would be less great but they would tend to run in the same direction. Mm -hmm. So even if I looked at what people earned before taxes, the United States would be more unequal than any other, what's called OECD country, than say Mexico. Mexico would be the only other very unequal one. Um, but especially after taxes, that's true. Big contrasts. If you look at the, so the level of taxation uh, with presumably the money being spent to equalize income, a large portion of the taxation going to that purpose, directed to that purpose. That's true in, in most of the countries where you have relative, most of the countries in the developed world where you have relatively high levels of taxation. The purpose is to uh, dis redistribute for the most part? The announced purpose? Um, no, the, that's not the announced purpose because politically it may not be so convenient for them to, to say so. But in addition, the, it is true, as I think you're implying, that say a high tax, high budget country of Western Europe does more equalizing of incomes through the budget than we do. Yes, true. The you difference they don't the, announce it. You think they're shy about it? I would. I would have well, that's the, the part they, of the because they usually that. have other um, justifications too. They say it's good for growth. It's good right. for the demand for goods and services. They have many justifications. And usually, though, they're saying equality is good for growth. So oh, they're yeah. making people equal. Uh, some some will say that. Yeah. yeah. Now. Um, the let's see. Um, I've got to decide where to pick up next year. Um, in the European countries, um, sorry, uh, g give me give me give me a new question again because we had about three at once here. <laughs> okay. Yes, uh, how their inequality differed? Um, well, um, we're sort of talking about the effects of, of, of taxation here and creating okay. more equality. Right. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's right. We were. Uh, sorry. Um, the, but one should not overdo the contrast because, in fact, here's what's interesting. If you took, say, an American conservative's view of what's the better kind of tax, you would like, say, a general tax on consumption, uh, and uh, do not double tax interest and dividends or other accumulationist uh, kinds of incomes. What's interesting, and this is one of the things I have found uh, and documented, is that the uh, high budget countries use the kinds of taxes the conservative would have wanted more, uh, more than we do. We tax corporate income more than they. We double tax income, interest, and dividends more than they, though it was that gap was reduced under Bush's tax laws. We uh, have a general uh, f vociferous fight over progressive taxation in the income tax structure that is not happening in, say, a Nordic country or Germany or the Netherlands. They don't do that. They actually have the very interesting political outcome that most of, now, the taxes are somewhat progressive, right? The system, I'm sorry, the system is somewhat progressive. Here's what they do. They use um, general consumption taxes, like flat tax, and t uh, sin taxes, alcohol, tobacco, gasoline, and 
they use those kinds of taxes, a large share of the burden of which does fall on the common people. The people who will still vote for, say, social democrat parties who want this kind of social insurance and safety nets. It's not, they didn't go soak the rich for it all. They actually had the masses pay for much of it. But where they get the progressivity, the uh, reduction in income, in the gap in incomes after tax, et cetera, they get the progressivity on the expenditure side. They have universal, fairly flat entitlements to health care and schooling, et cetera, relative to us. And so it's in the outcome of how the money is spent that they do things in a very egalitarian way. It's not the taxation really soaking the rich over there. We do as much of it here as there. So you're Just sort of about. suggesting that they, they don't soak the rich, so presumably that creates more incentive for getting rich. Yeah. They don't soak the rich, yeah. uh, but on the other hand, uh, they don't have generalized entitlements either. They focus the benefits on those who have less. No, no, no. The, the entitlements are generalized. Um, so it is not, for example, you have a means test to see, are you poor? Oh, then you get in the... No, they don't do that. You know, everybody gets that entitlement. Middle class, upper class, anybody will get the same kind of basic health entitlement, which is a large share of, say, the health system. So that's kind of the way they do it. And they achieve the progressivity, I would say, on the expenditure side, not on the tax side. The taxes are paid as pretty much as a close, a pretty close to being a fixed proportion of your income, more than an American would think. I'll put it that way. They have some progressivity in the income tax. Yeah, yeah, yeah in Europe. But it sure. sounds like it sounds like you're saying that major burden of paying tax doesn't fall on the very rich, but on the middle stratus, perhaps, yes, lower everybody. middle stratus. No. And then when the money goes back, uh, it goes to everybody, uh, and there's more people in the lower and middle stratus than at the top. So there's sort of, it sounds like a system where you should be getting back, you're getting back what you put in. I don't see how that would compress, it's, it's, compress the, so, the difference so, all that much. So you do, so there is, well, you're getting, mm, getting back what you put in. Not exactly. The, um, the expenditures, think of them as being more like a flat per capita expenditure, something like uh, Friedman once described as the negative income tax base kind of thing. The taxes are a proportion of income. See, it's in that tilt there through health and education and the like that you get a result that you are making the incomes more equal. Um, what I'm tilting against is the people's perceptions that this is actually happening on the tax side. It's not that they soak the rich. I want to add an important footnote because some people will think, wait a minute, that's not true. But it is, what I'm saying is true that they don't have huge taxes on the super rich. Now, that's an important, I think, a correction to a lot of North American perceptions about the European system. The quick important footnote. Somebody might go to the library and say, oh, look, at it. I, look I'm reading about 70% and above as the top income tax rate in Sweden. That was before 1992, and it was also fiction, even before 1992, because they had so many ways out of it. They have they loopholes? Did, huh? They have loopholes? Oh, major loopholes. They had loopholes uh, the government could send you. That, that, that generally comes then with high tax rates. It, it comes with high tax rates, I'm sure, mm -hmm. uh, as a political outcome. Um, they had loopholes, so they weren't actually paying it in the first place, but then they cleaned up that system, and now we don't even see the mess. Now it's... Uh, so they got rid of loopholes, and they lowered the rates. And lowered the rates. So the incidence isn't very much different in how tax It didn't come out much different, yeah. Uh -huh. That's right. They are slightly more progressive in their income tax structure than us, partly because the money is spent on things that are so equal as investments in people of all income strata. So you think the United States gets the worst of both worlds? We have a kind of uh, income tax system that penalizes wealth accumulation, uh, and we don't have enough investment for the folks at the bottom that would build up human capital. Yes. I think that, that that's that's... We, we oversimplify, but you're over, oversimplifying in the right direction, yes. So it's a kind of hybrid political prescription that you're offering here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that, and that was the result. And many people, when reacting to my finding this, uh, correctly saw it that way. That is one of the interesting things about them. Where, where is their huge tax base? It's on ordinary labor. It's on you talking about there in uh, Western Europe. Western Europe. Um, 
alcohol, tobacco, gasoline, and flat-out consumption. One last question, how are the former communist countries doing in these respects? Struggling in all respects. Uh, they, they have a, let's see, they are varied, and the, the, even after the, this quarter century, the jury's still out as to what kind of system uh, Eastern European countries will develop, except to say that it's going to be separate, right? They, they are not the same as each other. Um, the Estonians are very sort of almost like free market libertarian, except that the <laughs> They use the dead hand of the government to make sure that the Russians must learn Estonian language in schools. <laughs> I mean, a very important restriction on freedom, uh, and because uh, you know uh, a quarter of the population is well, Russian. So many Russians were settled there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, yes. And they've been nice enough not to expel them. So what? That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's maybe a fair deal. Uh, so they're different from each other. A common problem that the Eastern European countries have is that. Their population is extremely old, and their elderly have even more sort of panicked insistence than ours that their pensions are a, a, a bit, have to be a big share of what the government's spending its money on. And that's very tough for them because they want to recover from their mm -hmm. communism and their post communist shocks, and they can't, you know, take that money away from them fast enough to make the recovery happen faster. So they have a problem with the elderly in many of those countries. Uh, but there are success cases. I mean, some were in good shape all along, like Slovenia, uh, you know, up against Austria there. Uh, they, they were always in pretty good shape. Poland has really come along mm -hmm. and is doing beautifully. What would you attribute Poland's success to? Um, Part of it, of course, is that uh, they were able to uh, get a lot of remittances uh, in the crisis period in the 1990s and the first decade of this century when they were just getting themselves going again. Poles went to other uh, countries to the West and cashed in. That helped. Uh, Poland's, uh, Poland has less residual strength of the Communist Party than some other Eastern European mm -hmm. countries. That was certainly a help. Well, fascinating. Thank you. thank you for spending time with us. Okay, thank you. Uh, and stay tuned for the next Institute okay. Encounter.